Imagine having near-death experiences, dealing with the mafia, and writing about things like MK Ultra and the government's plot for mind control, to being in Cuba at the height of the Fidel Castro regime. One person who doesn't have to imagine that life is Joe Thomas. Meet Joe Thomas. She's not any ordinary woman. A shy housewife turned to a New York Times investigative journalist, she's not only blazed the trail for women, but she has lived the kind of life you'd write about in movies. From writing stories about injustices in black Cincinnati neighborhoods to covering tragic stories like the Timothy McVeigh bombings, this former New York Times reporter is ready to tell it all in her new memoir, Striving. I wrote a book about my journey from being a young housewife who didn't know what she wanted to do in life to becoming a senior investigative reporter at the New York Times. And I did it because I wanted to encourage young women like I was back then to realize that they have so many chances in life and not to be discouraged, especially when they're young, about roadblocks or feeling that it's all over when life is just really beginning. In this episode of Road to 1000, I got a chance to sit down with this living treasure to get an in-depth look into the woman who's created change that impacted communities and brought truth to light about things that were being hidden in the dark. I wrote this book as an adventure story, as a way to keep people reading. Uh, but when I started out, I had no idea that there were so many adventures in store for me. When I was 24 years old, I felt like I was 100 years old and that wow. my life was pretty much over. And sometimes when you're very young, it's hard to imagine all the possibilities that are ahead for you because you don't have the experience to imagine them. So I basically wrote this book to encourage women to be brave and uh, to keep going. Well, I got all of that from the book. <laughs> it was definitely an adventure. It was definitely, it was like almost like, um, I don't know if you ever like heard of the show Wishbone, but it kind of like, you know, Wishbone would take you back through time and history and like you like learn all of his different stuff. And like, I kind of felt like I got to experience things that I grew up knowing about, but because I was young, I didn't understand. So like reading your book, like learning about like the Timothy Bay and like the story behind that, like why that was such a big deal. Your book kind of gave me, kind of filled in the gaps a little bit of certain things that I just didn't understand as a kid. Well, I wanted to put people on the ground with me. I think that journalism in whatever form it takes is so important to democracy because when things happen in the dark, in public life, when we don't know about things that are going on, it's impossible for people to make good choices. Yeah. And so we, it's easy to be maneuvered or manipulated in the decisions that we make. And journalists are really, really important in ferreting out the truth about things. And that's why I think it's so important to have women as journalists. And that's why I think it's really important to have people come from all kinds of different backgrounds to be journalists. During the late 19th and early 20th century, journalism was a male-dominated industry. However, there were several women journalists who would go on to impact the world of journalism by telling hard-hitting investigative stories that would change the landmark of our country. However, like women of that time, their accomplishments in this field historically would be minimized or ignored. Something that I never knew because we were written out of history is that women were among the, they invented investigative reporting back in the 19th century. Ida B. Wells and other writers went into factories and laundries and places where workers were really being exploited. Nobody mm -hmm. noticed them. And they came out and they wrote about this stuff. Yeah. And uh, they had readerships in the thousands, but the men got jealous, so the women got fired, and then they were forgotten. Being a housewife in the 1960s was top priority on most women's list. Going back over my high school yearbook, I was amazed at how many of my high school friends in my graduating class, and I'm Gosh, guys, this is really old. I was a high school class of 1961. Mm, okay. How many people wrote in, you know, their what I want to be, that mm. they wanted to be a housewife? I would say most of the girls, that was their goal. 
Women during that era were expected to maintain a pristine home, raise the children, and support their husbands without pursuing ambitions of their own outside the household. Women were raised to believe that this was the way of life. Even though I went to college, I didn't put that in mind, but even though I went to college and, I, and, and then I got married, and then I went to a year of grad school, that's what I thought women did. Magazines, TV shows, and advertisements all glorified the image of the perfect housewife. Any deviation from this norm was often met with raised eyebrows and whispered judgments. Yet, beneath the polished surface, many women yearn for more. And I married this wonderful guy, very handsome, college football player, very smart, very nice. And he has this great, you know, junior level corporate job. And we get to his new job and we're sitting there in the living room with his boss and uh, we're talking about this great life we're going to have now. He's out of school and I'm out of school. And I'm sitting there and I think, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a housewife. You know what? I don't want to do this. Mm. I've spent my whole life getting ready to do it. And you know what? I don't want to do this. Oh, yeah. What am I doing here? And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Like, I signed up to do this. I wanted to do this. I'm nuts. So um, I, I finished my master's thesis, which I hadn't finished. And then I looked at my husband and I said, I'm getting a job. And mm. I walked out the door. I didn't care what kind of a job I got. I just knew that I was not going to join the other corporate wives in the junior league. Nothing against the junior league. It, mm -hmm. For some people, they would love to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's a great organization, but I, I wanted a job. Today, more women are chasing careers in the U.S. than ever before, with over 56% of women working in the workforce. Seeing a career woman today is like seeing a Starbucks on every corner. However, during Joe's time, that wasn't always the case. I started out not knowing that women could have a career because I never met a woman with a career. I didn't know that women did that. All the women I'd met were housewives. Yeah. And I'm not putting women who have homemaking as a life, I am not putting them down. There have been periods in my life when my children have a huge part of my life. I did take seven years off when my children were very young and taught at the university because it let me spend a huge amount of time with my kids. I do understand what a huge commitment it is to stay home with children. Yeah. And how much work it is. And I honor women who choose to do that. I, I know that you can't have it all. <laughs> Believe me. Being a journalist means sometimes you may cover major tragedies. In her memoir, Joe Thomas shares some of the tragic stories she's covered from the crash of TW8 Flight 128 to covering the Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols Oklahoma City bombing trials. Doing this job, She's not immune to the grief that comes with telling these stories. Stories like the night she met one of the 10 survivors from Flight 128's plane crash and how that impacted her life. He had been uh, holding his wife's hand when the plane crashed and it broke open right in front of their seats and it fell on top of her. Mm. And uh, he couldn't get her out and, uh, and he ran away and seconds later the plane exploded and caught fire so he was mm. one of the 10 passengers who lived wow. but he was consumed with grief that yeah. he couldn't save her but he basically gave the priest and me the story of what happened which was that the plane hit the ground and broke apart i was the only reporter who talked to a survivor three of the 10 were infants and babies that night and so when I left, I felt terribly guilty that I had talked to him. That is something that happens to journalists. I had to deal with it my whole career, you know, coming that close to that much grief. I covered yeah. the uh, Oklahoma City bombings, and I uh, covered both of the trials, one for each of the bombers, Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols, 
and I got to know the families of the people who were killed and injured in that bombing. We just, we cried our way through both of those trials. And so being a journalist, it's not like watching a movie. You are with the people who yeah. are there. So it, it does take a lot out of you. You wrote at the end, which I thought was interesting that you wrote this in the book. You was like, was I wrong to stay where I was not allowed? Are reporters necessary? And do we torment people? Did you ever come up with a solution and answer to those questions? Well, I think it's very important that reporters are there because we are the witnesses for the public. Yeah. We are not there for ourselves. It should not be about us. Mm -hmm. It's about what's happening. It's about the people who are there. That's why I never wanted to be one of the glamorous women on television. I was mm -hmm. glad that I could walk down the street and no one knew who I was. So I think we're essential to getting at the truth of what's really going on. But doing that can be very dangerous. It can be very, very painful. And you are never a celebrity. You are never... Um, you know, personally admired. <laughs> You're never a rock star. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I feel like it depends on who you're, you're right. If you're, if the person's in the right, then you're talking and asking them and making them look good, then they'll love it. But if you're questioning things that they don't want people to know about, I'm pretty sure you're not their favorite person. <laughs> I have not been the favorite person of people who have ended up going to prison because of my stories. <laughs> pretty sure. uh, but so, some of my stories did result in, in playgrounds getting built in neighborhoods where children were getting killed by cars because wow. their playgrounds were taken for interstate highways that were put through their communities. And the money for those playgrounds was taken and spent on recreation in wealthy neighborhoods and their neighborhoods got nothing, and their kids were getting hit by cars because they, they, it, the houses in, in those old neighborhoods came right down to the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and then there was no, no place to play. So the city did nothing for those kids. So if you point this out, then people, in this case the federal government, heard about the outrage in the neighborhoods, and they came up with some money for playgrounds. So, but if the public doesn't know, how can they do anything about it? That's that's where the press comes in. It's interesting in today's day and age, right? Because you have everybody's kind of like a becoming a reporter or a journalist now because of social media. And so <laughs> I feel like you have the people who do have the integrity who desire to tell the truth and that's it. And then you do have people who just it's more about them and whatever they have to say. And so they can misconstrue the truth a little bit to create sensationalism. So do you feel like journalism has that written in? Because I mean, especially now with it being more about clicks and likes and views, do you feel like journalism in a way, depending on where you work, that's kind of like the unspoken thing to make it as sensational as possible? I think that is a great question. We've always had journalism as entertainment. I think that's where tabloid newspapers would come in with really sensational stories where they really didn't care whether their stories about, mostly they used to be about movie stars and celebrities, and they didn't really care whether they told the truth about them or not. Mm -hmm. And often the movie stars just wanted more publicity and they didn't care too much whether the stories were true or not, as long as they were photographed well, and a lot of people heard about them, then maybe they'd go to their next movie. But now that that's all moved online, you get a lot of people trying to put stuff online that's not true, that's really malicious, where people get hurt or they get killed or they get stalked um, because people will put up terrible lies about them. And I, I find that very frightening. And I think that someone who gets their news online, if it doesn't come from an established news organization, and, and we pretty much know who they are, mm -hmm. has to be very, very careful. As a white woman, Jo Thomas lended her voice to many black causes and was not afraid to go into neighborhoods that were in need of a voice. During her early time as a reporter, there were no black reporters to speak on black issues. 
Her voice gave a platform to an underrepresented community, making her an ally. However, today, some allies get criticized just for trying to help. Because I think that's kind of like the issue that we're seeing today, right? Like a lot of people are getting upset when there are white voices speaking on certain stories that are happening within minority communities. But for me, I'm like, if someone has a voice and they have a platform and they're able to highlight, and there's a difference between someone taking advantage of the moment and someone who's actually, you know, mm -hmm. trying to bring awareness to what's happening. So what would you say to people, especially people of color who kind of have that like fight? Why it's important for us to have as many voices on a topic as opposed to just saying, oh, only, you know, black people can talk about black people problems. I think that if you have a problem you need as many allies as you can get and as many as much light as you can get shed on that problem until you get rid of yeah. the problem. That's my feeling about it. I, I think that bad things happen in the dark and mm. when people can do terrible things and then walk away with their pockets full of money while people suffer and that and the people that have walked away with the money have no consequences that's just not right mm. so that's where yeah. the press can come in and tell the public you know what this is going on and your tax dollars are paying for some of it do you want to pay for this or not joe thomas life is too much to be captured in one book i cut it in yeah. half i mean it was twice as long <laughs> No one would ever be able to make their way through it, but maybe I'll write a second yeah. book. Who knows? However, the adventures she's experienced and the life she's lived is one for the ages. Her story is proof that women can achieve the greatest heights if we believe in ourselves and go after our dreams. I just want to say that I wrote the book because all of us have an opportunity to learn and experience so much in life that we don't expect. If given the opportunity, and if we take that opportunity, and kind of never know how it's going to show up. So yeah. I wanted readers to enjoy some of the experiences I had. And I hope that people will read it, yeah. and have fun reading it, and, and take away with it something that will mean something in their own lives. That's my hope. Yeah. So that's why I wrote the book. Well, I could definitely say that it's inspirational for women. I think a lot of women who read it will be inspired because it it lets me know like there's so much that I can do and like don't let yeah. women you know stop you like you know what I mean like yeah there's scary things but like if you really believe in something and have the passion like you can achieve something great. Her book, Striving: Adventures of a Female Journalist in a Man's World, a True Story, is available now on Amazon.com. Grab your copy today to explore the amazing adventures and extraordinary life of Joe Thomas. This is The Road to 1000 with 994 more to go. Stay tuned for more women's stories, adventures, and discoveries. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that like button if you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to leave a comment for Joe down below. And until next time, my name is Whitney and I'm out. As I said in the book, I had the Rolls Royce haircut. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so I didn't get hired for the job. I had the world's worst job interview too, so I didn't get the first job. Yeah. I got the second job thanks yeah. to the Cincinnati Strangler. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Like when you said about the haircut, I was like, I feel like everyone can relate to that moment where it's like you're going for this opportunity and then like your hair is just like whatever. Um, but I thought it was it actually worked out in your favor because you know, not getting that first job gave you the Cincinnati post job. So it's kinda like you know, it, it worked in some ways. <laughs> well, you know, everybody's had a terrible haircut and they exactly. wonder, you know, should I really try to do anything when I look like this? Yeah. When I look this horrible? Yeah. And I just said, well, you know, that's me. That's how I look at the moment. I'm going yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you got to take the opportunity when it comes. <laughs>